Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. Today we talk with Terrence Healy, a biochemist and fellow at the Cato Institute on why the science will never be settled. Check it out. Uh, Terrence Keeley, welcome, and uh, I want to get into your uh, 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 bio a little bit so that people understand your your credentials, but unlike Bill Nye, you actually are a science guy. Is that fair to say? Unlike Bill Nye, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me give, me, give me some of your academic credentials, and, and, and you're still you still are a professor and, and all that stuff. Yeah, well, I started off, funnily enough, uh, a medical school. I originally trained as a doctor. In England, you can go to medical school at the age of 17, which is a, an odd way of doing it. So uh, that's what I did first, and that's when I discovered that I really love science. And so although I did qualify as a doctor, uh, I then went straight and did a PhD. As it happened, it was at Oxford. And then I spent many years lecturing in what we call clinical biochemistry at Cambridge, um, but during this time, I became increasingly disenchanted with the way government in Britain was running first the National Health Service, which I think is a very suboptimal way of delivering health care, and then the universities. And I think the government was really damaging the universities with its constant interference. And so I moved to the University of Buckingham, which is the only university in Britain independent of state funding, at least core state funding. And I did that for a number of years and then ended up at Cato, where I've been for the last three years. Yeah. And you are an adjunct fellow at Cato. Um, what's, what's, your, what's your field? Just science generally? It, well, it's science policy, but in particular, specifically at Cato, I've been working on nutrition science, but really I've been working on the general area of how it is that the government funding of science is both unnecessary and damaging. Yeah. And you and your colleague, Patrick Michaels, have a, I believe this is a brand new book called Scientocracy. The Tangled Web of Public Science and Public Policy. What's, what's the thesis? Because that's what we're going to get the into. The thesis is really simple. Um, and in fact, let me just embody it in this way. There's a professor at Arizona State University called Dan Sarovitz. And he came up with a very interesting phrase. And his phrase was, it's technology that keeps science honest. And the reason that's significant, let me explain. We're now living through what's called the reproducibility crisis in science. Uh, John Ioannidis at Stanford has published a paper that's never been rebutted. In fact, it's widely accepted now that no fewer than half of all published papers are wrong. There are whole areas of science. Nutrition is one, but there are whole areas of science where the quality of the science is so poor that the chances are that the paper that you're reading is not just wrong, but possibly even diametrically opposed to what we've turned out to, to know is true. Nutrition is the classic example. Um, we have been brought up most of our lives to avoid fat and eat carbohydrate. And we now know that the truth is, in fact, the exact opposite. Earlier, before this podcast started, we were talking about the food pyramid, the famous food pyramid that people of our generation were brought up on. The food pyramid actually is a really useful guide to food. You take the pyramid, you invert it, hmm. and that's the way to go. But of course, that was a government program. You know, I'm, I'm interested in a food pyramid that says I should eat more pizza and french fries. <laughs> and I would be willing to finance that research. <laughs> but it may not be scientifically valid. Well, unfortunately, it's scientifically very invalid. Yeah. But it's how the food pyramid used to be written. Exactly, yeah. Um, so, But to come back to this business of science, what, what is it that's gone wrong with science? Because 100 years ago, no one believed that half of all published papers were wrong. There was a real trust in science 100 years ago, even 50 years ago. But the, the reproducibility crisis, um, which is about 10 years old now, with the realization that the majority of papers in whole fields such as psychology cannot be reproduced, has caused a real, a real crisis in science. And it's technology that keeps science honest. The point is that over the last 70 or so years, Science has moved away from the market. And the market is all about technology. It's about a scientist. If a scientist says A equals B, and B is a motor car, say, or a boat, and it crashes or it sinks, you know that A is wrong. But science is now funded by the government. And now, if you're a scientist and you want to get promoted, or you want to get grants, or you want to get published, 
you're not anymore dealing with technology, which is real. You're dealing with peer review. And peer review is a group of fellow scientists who have beliefs. So if you look at nutrition, for 40 years now, your fellow scientists have believed that pizza is good for you because that's what it says in the food pyramid. And if you use enough statistics, you can show, inverted commas, you can prove, inverted commas, that pizza is good for you because you make damn sure, if you want your paper published or your grant to be funded or your promotion at the university to be achieved, you make damn sure you pick the particular statistics that prove that pizza is good for you. Yeah. And that's what's gone wrong with science. The government funding of science has created a huge bubble of rent seekers where everyone reinforces everyone else's prejudices in a way that allows people to select the data they want to promote their careers and to hell with reality. And you talk about the, the first chapter is sort of a um, brief history of, of science throughout human history. And am I right in saying that, that sort of the nationalization of science and the creation of the National Foundation, Na National Science Foundation, uh, emerged out of, of World War II and, and the need to have more science for the conduct of war. The history of American science is fascinating. It's like a light switch. So the Industrial Revolution, as everyone knows, starts in Britain when it's completely laissez-faire. There is no government funding for science in Britain, and the British lead the Industrial Revolution. The country that takes over around 1890 as the lead industrial nation, it still is, of course, is the United States. And between 1890 and 1940, just as laissez-faire in Britain, the American government did not fund science, period. Curiously, the two countries whose governments did fund science, France and Germany, always lagged. It's a complete myth they overtook Britain. They never did until latterly in the 60s and 70s, but that was a problem that Britain had, nothing to do with France and Germany. And so we have the story of 200 years of industrial leadership, first Britain and then America, all laissez-faire. What happens in America, and America is like this light switch, is you have first the Second World War, and suddenly the American government, the federal government's pouring money into science, things like the Manhattan Project, you know, the atom bomb, which of course are very successful. And then you have this huge core of scientists in 1945 who are terrified that someone is going to suggest that now the war is over, they might go back to their peacetime activities. And they didn't want to go back to their peacetime activities because a peacetime activity for a scientist is actually delivering useful, ultimately useful technology to a company or a foundation like the American Heart Foundation. It's not sitting around doing what you want to do according to what your friends think you want to do. It's actually being accountable to some external person who's funding you. So the scientists got together and they created uh, something called the RAND Corporation together with Douglas Aircraft and with the American Air Force. And the RAND Corporation propagated these myths that actually America would do better in its economy after the war if it modeled itself on the failures, France and Germany, rather than stick with the successful formula that Britain and America had had. We needed the federal government to fund science. And only if the federal government funded science, so the Rand Corporation said, and so other scientists said, only then will the American economy take off. And so the National Science Foundation was then created, as you pointed out, in 1950, because ironically, the arguments didn't hold. People could see through those arguments until the Cold War. And when the Cold War broke out, when Truman declared his doctrine, reversing a 200-year history of no foreign entanglements, at that point, America reverted as it always reverts to the funding of science for military reasons. And Truman was persuaded to pour science into the National Science Foundation and the NIH, actually, National Institute of Health, not to do science per se, but to produce a vast cohort of trained scientists who the government can then direct to the CIA and all those other agencies so we can go around killing Soviet people. So it, it essentially the, the scientific community created a cartel and, and a way to sort of guarantee the, the flow of, of, of cash. So it became a, a lucrative business model. But, but you argue that the, the, essentially this, this feels like public education in a lot of ways. The more we spend on science, the poorer the results we get over time. And, and we've, we've gone from, from this radically laissez-faire world where it's just, just in, uh, beautiful and insane levels of innovation to... to now politicians telling us uh, this this phrase triggers me whenever a politician or an advocate says the science is settled 
it sort of violates everything I understand about science, which is a is this process of 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 challenging the existing paradigm and 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 sort of crazy people that are not respected from the outside coming in and saying, you know what, you're completely wrong. And by crazy, I may be talking about um, Einstein, someone like that, who says that everything you think you know is wrong. Um, but without that process and with, with, an, with an established order that, that peer reviews everything, how do you get that dynamic disruption that creates scientific discovery? Okay, well, let, there are two halves to your question. Let me take the second half, the science is settled. Uh, the science has to be settled if you're running a cartel um, because you, you have to reinforce the message. The, the, my personal experience of the science being settled, and it was a personal but very intense experience, so my wife and I had our first child in 1991. And when we had our first child, we were told very firmly the science was settled. Newborn babies had to be put to sleep on their tummies because if they weren't put to sleep on their tummies, they would develop something that we in England call cot death. And there was a terrible epidemic of cot deaths at the time across the world, by the way. In 1993, when we had our second child, we were informed that the science was settled. And you had to put your baby on its back or it would get cot death, because we now know that 70%, 70% of the cot deaths came from the previous regime when the science had been settled and we always had to put our babies on their tummies. What startled me about this almost gestalt switch from one to the other is no one ever said, oh, sorry, we got that wrong. Yeah. No one ever said, there was no grey period when people started discussing. It just went from a literally a flick of a switch. One morning, everyone woke up to be told the science had been settled in a completely new way. This is a very unscientific way of approaching the world. Yeah. And we know, of course, that in fact, the great disruptors often do come from left field, as we say in England, with ideas that are utterly rejected by the mainstream of science. The problem is that the mainstream of science now is monolithic because there's basically only one funder, which is the federal government. They've crowded out the myriad of private funders, whether they're companies or foundations, hugely crowded out. And so we now have a monolithic science where only one group of men and women determine what is right and what is wrong. And if you don't subscribe to that, you don't get funded. Max Planck, the great German physicist, once said that science advances funeral by funeral, by which he meant that science is always in the grip in those days, all men, of course, in the grip of old men who know, inverted commas, the truth. And only when those men die can youngsters come along and replace them. But unfortunately, if there's only one funder of science, then what you get is what a group of scientists recently called the natural selection of bad science. So these people are propagating a false vision, such as fat is bad for you, and they make damn sure their successors also subscribe because there's no competition of funding for different sources of information. So is it, is it, is it um, too far to say that, that science is never settled, that even the things that we think we understand um, fundamentally might in fact and should in fact be open to scientific challenge and, and, and threats of a better idea. Science is never settled. I mean, if you were to talk to the average 19th century physicist, two, 300 years after Newton and all that, it seemed that physics was done. In fact, physics was a closed book. In fact, why would anyone go into physics? Yeah. And then Einstein comes along with relativity, then Planck actually, coming back to him, comes along with uh, quantum mechanics, and suddenly we realize that everything we thought we knew was absolutely, it wasn't wrong, it just was insufficient to explain. And once you go fast enough, I'm talking about the speed of light now, suddenly Newtonian physics doesn't make sense. So, so the science is never settled, it can't be settled. And um, if 19th century physics could be wrong, then anything can be wrong. Let's talk about, uh, let's use the example, because you've written a lot about the food pyramid and, and basically the government has made us fat and unhealthy. Thank you very much. Um, although I love listicles that, that, uh, that I find online that, that rationalize my, my personal lifestyle choices. Like I love listicles that tell me that beer is really good for me. And I think that's, that's important science. And, and I feel like that is actually settled, but, but let's, let's talk about the food pyramid because, um, it, it's a great, let, let's dig in a little bit deeper about, about why we came up with these horribly wrong conclusions, why they were locked into place. Um, you have a whole chapter on the book on this and, and, and what might be the alternative to, to you know, a Senate yeah. committee hearing. <laughs> well, um, the food pyramid is a very tragic story because you're absolutely right. 
1977, the federal government issued formal advice. Um, fat was bad for you, carbohydrate was good for you, switch. And if you look at the uh, patterns of eating in this country, it's all explained, as you say, in the book, you can see that people actually did as they were told. People stopped eating fat and started eating carbohydrate. And by some extraordinary coincidence, the obesity epidemic takes off in 1980. Yeah. Uh, it takes about three years for people to start putting on the pounds, and then they've been putting on the pounds ever since. It's a tragic tale. It came out a very interesting story. There was a genuine problem, not just in America, but throughout the Western world, um, in the 50s and 60s, a terrible epidemic of heart attacks. Middle-aged men, it, it was mainly men, um, middle-aged men were just dropping, just dropping down dead at, at the height of their apparent strength. Even Eisenhower had a heart attack. And um, suddenly everyone became aware that an astonishing proportion of deaths, something like a third of all deaths were due to heart attacks. And this had apparently had come from nowhere. In the 19th century, doctors didn't talk about heart attacks. So there didn't seem to be heart attacks in the 19th century. It really was a new disease. And everyone was absolutely petrified. Who was going to die next? It was a genuine public health emergency. So let's not pretend it wasn't. It was a genuine public health emergency. But what happened was a man called Ansel Keys, now dead, professor of physiology in Minnesota. He came along and just as Greta Thunberg uh, is Time Person of the Year, so on the front of Time magazine, so we find Ansel Keys on the cover of Time magazine, although I don't think he was ever Person of the Year, uh, claiming he knew how to solve the heart attack problem. Because if you look at someone's blood vessels who've died of a heart attack, the blood vessel's full of fat. Therefore, it seemed very obvious to Ansel Keys that you just had to eat less fat and you wouldn't get atherosclerosis. It was a stunningly naive and simplistic model that even at the time people denied. The trouble was that it entered into the field of politics because, of course, politicians were dying of heart attacks like everyone else. And politicians. So suddenly it was real. Suddenly it was real. Yeah. And politicians wanted to seize on a story that they could then sell to the American public as representing themselves as the saviors of the American public. Vote for me, I will save you from having a heart attack. And so they seized on a story that was utterly premature. What Ansel Keys did is exactly as I described earlier. He was, and by the way, the two great authors here are Nina Tietjolts, or Nina Tietjolts, I never know how you pronounce her name, an American journalist who wrote a great book called Big Fat Surprise, and Gary Taubes, who wrote a similar book earlier called Good Calories, Bad Calories. These are the two great authors in this field, and they did a lot of uncovering of what was going on. But what Ansel Keys did, he essentially bullied. It's a really shocking story of just how one man with utter certainty and a very strong character can basically bully first his peers and then their subordinates and then the journals. And you get into a situation where it becomes self-referential. People don't want to upset Ansel because he's a monster. So they go along with what he says and then other people go along with what they say. And before you know where you are, you have an entire scientific community subscribing because the science is settled to a completely false hypothesis. He was just wrong. But no one dared for about 40 years point out that he was wrong. No one dared point out that the emperor had no clothes. That, that that reminds me, I've, I've never heard that story, but it reminds me a little bit of uh, John Maynard Keynes and the, and the paradigm shift in economics. Um, Hayek and Keynes famously were debating um, whether or not uh, Keynesian manipulation of the macro economy was a, was a, was a smart thing. But um, when, you, when you read the history, Keynes was a, a politically savvy demagogue, he, who also, by the way, happened to be saying something that politicians want to hear. And isn't that the other element of this is that there was a, there was a bunch of interest groups um, uh, and, and, and at some point the Department of Agriculture got involved, but there was a bunch of interest groups that would, that would glom on to this new food pyramid and, and reinforce and, and entrench a scientific paradigm that said, you know what, uh, eating carbohydrates and sugar is better than fat. There's no question that there were food groups deeply involved. I mean, what's very interesting is that in 1977, when the Senate committee first put out this official advice, I think it was January or February 1977, saying eat less fat, eat more carbohydrates, the American beef industry dissented upon them. I mean, it was, it was pretty tough, apparently. And so they had to issue a second report around October, November, same year, um, softening much of their advice because they'd been so 
bullied, if that's not the wrong word, by the beef industry. Unfortunately, the real problem, and I'm glad you asked that question because it's going to allow me to say something I really want to say. The real problem with food research is the huge number of vested interests on all sides. Yeah. There's a very good woman called Marion Nestle. She's professor of nutrition at New York University. She pointed out that when she first started to work for the federal government, she, she, she quickly scuttled back to academia. But for a short time, she worked for the federal government. And she was told in no uncertain terms, laid out, the one thing we must never say is to eat less of anything. Because the moment you say that, someone will descend upon you and your senator will be on the phone. There is a role for the funding of science, by the way. There is a role for the American government to fund science. There's no question about that. But the role is very different from the one we're told. What we need... And even Hayek would agree, you know, you, Mises would agree, you do need the rule of law, you do need institutions to protect the market. What we need is a completely independent authoritative voice that actually looks at the data objectively, challenging industry. Now, the tragedy is that foundations and other independent institutions used to do that really quite well. But to a huge extent, they've been crowded out by the government. So in as much as we have government funding of science, let it be there to challenge vested interests, yeah. not to reinforce them. Yeah. And that includes challenging government. I, you know, I, I refer to the sugar industrial complex and, and a lot of the, and I, I just broke the rule, by the way, of, of, of naming names. So I assume I'll be ascended upon by, by sugar lobbyists of, of all kinds. But the, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember during the, the war on fatty foods, these very sugary snacks that were, that were advertised as low fat, and, and we all gobbled them up because they were supposedly healthy for us because they were low fat. Um, but the sugar industry has been, and been quite destructive in, in terms of lobbying the government for and against certain policies and, and not just making us fat, but, but helping sort of engender this, this type two diabetes um, crisis, which is real today, but it's based on government policies. Yeah, I mean, sugar is the new tobacco. And um, I mean, the sugar lobby is very clever. So they point out quite correctly that there are countries like Australia where actually the sugar consumption has started to go down, but type 2 diabetes and obesity continue to go up. And therefore, it's not sugar. But of course, it's not just sugar. It's also carbohydrate sure. generally. But you, you talk about the, the fat Low, the, the low fat stories in the past. You go to super su Safeways just up the road from here, next to my hotel. Almost every yogurt there is still low fat, i.e., full of sugar. There are very few full fat yogurts in Safeway, so most people are still subscribing to the wrong story. We even know that the Senate committee, the McGovern Senate committee in 1977, that made these recommendations, their advisor, a man called Mark Hegstead, he was the head of the Department of Nutrition Science at Harvard University, one of the top people, he was actually being paid privately, as a, and he didn't declare it, a consultancy fee by the American sugar companies. So there's even corruption here. Yeah. And the whole business of high fructose, corn syrup and all that, it's incredibly political. But I think the way to understand sugar is as the new tobacco. And just as we know, the tobacco companies all lied. Uh, so the sugar companies are going to push the truth, put it that way. Yeah. There's this, uh, there's this beautiful bipartisanship with uh, protecting American sugar and the, the, the brothers in, in South Florida that, that kind of control the sugar cartel. Um, when I worked on Capitol Hill years ago, one of them was a Democrat who maxed out to all the Democrats. The other was a Republican who maxed out to all the Republicans. So sugar, uh, sugar lobbying has no, no political philosophy. It's just, it's just an interest group. Absolutely. I don't know what maxed out means. That's an American expression, but I think I know what it means. Giving them a lot of money. Oh, the, oh I see. No, I didn't yeah. understand that. Yeah. Oh, yes. Right. Maxed out political contributions. I see. I didn't yeah. understand that. Thank you. So let me tell you uh, a rather unpleasant story. So let me warn you. This is an unpleasant story. Um, so let me just prepare everyone. I'm about to tell you an unpleasant story. Okay. Tobacco kills you. Who discovered that? Who was it? I mean, we had King James of England in the 17th century, but thereafter, it became fashionable. I mean, doctors used to go around saying, unbelievably, in the early part of the 20th century, because they all used to smoke, everyone used to smoke, 
You took a cigarette in the morning, you cough up all your phlegm, and doctors would assure you that, that was that was good for you. It meant you were clearing out all your phlegm. So everyone was promoting tobacco as clearly being very good for you. And the tobacco companies, oddly, were very keen that you should believe that. And they would have these adverts. 55,000 doctors say that this is the best brand of tobacco, blah, 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 blah. Unfor and this is why the story becomes unpleasant. The person who discovered and showed that tobacco killed you was, of all people, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, and before we go any further, no one could loathe Adolf Hitler more than me. This is not in praise of Adolf Hitler. God forbid. I'm is, just illustrating a point. Isn't it frustrating that every time we talk about Hitler, we have to make that clear, that, that Hitler was a monster, as if we don't understand that but but go on i interrupt well yes i mean i, I just wouldn't want anyone to hitler's a bad guy hitler's <laughs> we have a consensus on this podcast hitler is a very bad guy the thing about hitler though and this is something that everyone should think about the world today the science has settled and this is often forgotten hitler subscribed 100 percent to what progressive people were thinking in the 30s hitler believed in eugenics well so did the united states of america i mean a hundred thousand people in the united states of america were sterilized against their will for the crime of being mentally defective i can't remember the, st the statistics were extraordinary in this country and the whole of northern europe believed in eugenics everyone believed in eugenics as did adolf hitler Adolf Hitler was a vegetarian. So is everyone today. You know, all cool people are vegetarians. He was a teetotaler. Uh, I, I could go on. And one of the things was he just intuitively felt that cigarettes just had to be good for you. So when he came to power in 1933, he called together his epidemiologists and said, I know, because I'm Adolf Hitler, I know that cigarettes are bad for you. Go out and prove it, or there may be some unfortunate circumstances. <laughs> So he, the, he was persuasive that way. He was very persuasive that way. He'd already, I mean, the first thing he did was open Dakar. Um, so he sent out these epidemiologists who, to their astonishment, they were surprised, discovered to their amazement that cigarettes are incredibly bad for you. And the evidence just fell out. It, was, it wasn't difficult work. It was all, of course, they used statistics, but it was almost non-statistical. The evidence was so clear that cigarettes cause lung cancer. It was unbelievably simple. And the extraordinary thing is, why did no one think of it before? What's interesting about that story is that Richard Doll in England knew perfectly well that the Nazi scientists had shown this, but the Nazi scientists were publishing in Nazi journals and no one else was reading their journals by the end of the Second World War. Richard Doll in Oxford, who I knew is a very nice man, he was a Marxist, which is actually not, not irrelevant. I, I, I mean, he was such a Marxist, Richard Doll, that he was actually refused admission to England, uh, to America in the 50s for various conferences. But he, because he was a Marxist, he was really determined to show that big tobacco was, was, was at fault. But he'd read those papers, and so he pretended that he'd made this discovery independently. But the reason I want to make this story, because it's such a memorable story, it does show how the real role of the government funding of science is to challenge vested interests, not just industry, but also other government interests if such a thing as possible. The trouble is that because we all believe that governments should fund science for economic reasons, which is a total myth, we all subscribe to the view that science should support industry, and that's a tragedy. Yeah, we we talk on this show a lot about about public choice economics and, and regulatory capture and this, you know, contradicting this naive view that that somehow people in a government agency, politicians, uh, public servants, and I'll put that in danger quotes, that they somehow have our interests in mind when they do things. But of course, the, the reality is they, they have their own interests. They have uh, political interests, whether it's be get, get reelected, um, they have uh, bureaucratic interests, which could just be expanding your funding base and, and creating job security. But it might also be risk aversion, which is a, is a big thing in the FDA. It's easier not to approve a drug sometimes because the, the risk, the bureaucratic risk, is that you would be held accountable if something goes wrong. No, I mean, that is a major problem in these agencies. Um, I mean, again, in nutrition, it's very interesting. Mark Hegstead, this very bad man I've talked about, the Harvard professor who was taking secret money from the sugar industry. If you actually read what he wrote in the very interesting 1977 Senate recommendations to the American people, he actually said in his own, he had his own special, he had a few pages of his own. He said, look, even if we're wrong, even if it turns out that... Um, uh, there's nothing wrong with fat. 
what harm can there be in reducing fat? That's what the next question he asks. Uh, to which the answer is, actually, if you're eating more carbohydrate, it does you a lot of harm. Um, and you're absolutely right. The problem with being in the public sector is that you can be really vilified for getting it wrong, but no one vilifies you if you don't take a risk. So what we need, actually, I mean, I absolutely understand the public choice theories. Of course I do. But equally, um, the idea that all bureaucrats are bad people looking solely to increase their power is clearly also wrong. I mean, what we need is a pluralistic society. There yeah. is a role for the public sector, but there's also very much a role both for the for-profit private sector and for the not-for-profit private sector. And ultimately, truth, I think, emerges from interactions between all three and the media as well, uh, rather than the simple naive belief in any one of these has a monopoly on truth. So talk about, uh, l let's, let's talk about the process of, of scientific discovery and, and what, what the right environment is for that. Because um, we libertarians, I think you identify as a libertarian as well. I'm, we'll use the L word on this show. Um, we, we struggle to explain the, the discovery process, the spontaneous order, the, the, the very unplanned process by which beautiful things happen when people cooperate. And, and we have politicians conversely, that love to swoop in, and it, this is not just something that one party or the other does, but I'll pick on Joe Biden because that's fun to do right now. He, he declared a couple of months ago that, that if he was elected president, he would cure cancer. He didn't. He did. Well, you know, the last time Americans did this, um, as you may know, that a very bad thing happened in 1776, which as an Englishman, I don't like to talk <laughs> about very much. Yeah, that, it would get uncomfortable if we, if yeah. we revisited that. So one. let's not revisit that unfortunate episode. <laughs> but in 1970, that's to say six years before the, the bicentennial, Congress passed, both houses, passed an act that cancer would be cured by 1976 in, to meet the centennial of yeah. 1776. Yeah. This is absolutely insane. Yeah. Um, I had no idea Joe Biden had said that. And I'm rather disappointed in him. Uh, it's a nonsense. Yeah. Um, but I don't share, by the way, I absolutely identify as a libertarian. <laughs> Although in England, we tend to say classical liberal. Yeah. And apparently there are, there are differences between classical liberals and libertarians, but they pass me by. Um, which does not mean I'm an anarchist. I, you know, I do believe in the state and rule of law and that sort of thing. But of course, I believe in a minimal state. Um, but I don't have any problems whatsoever with understanding uh, spontaneous order, you know, human action as opposed to human planning, because, well, I have just written a paper with my dear friend Martin Ricketts in which we have explained how science is funded by the private sector without government support. And we explained that there is a new economic good out there called a contribution good. And what a contribution good is, let's say, let's say that you and I want to make money out of uh, bread, say. And um, and bread has some technology like slicing. Let's pretend we're let's pretend we're both trying to invent sliced bread. Um, now, slicing bread is complicated for all sorts of reasons. You've got, you you know actually getting soft dough into slices requires a degree of technical expertise. Um, so we go out there, and what we both do is we both end up you know doing experiments, and then in the end, one of us but not will get there first. But because the only other people who know how to slice bread are other people who've also sliced bread. And so the only people who can benefit from the research of other people is those who have acquired the so-called tacit knowledge that comes from doing your own research, i.e. what we've shown Martin Ricketts and I in our economic model of the contribution good. People do science, such as inventing how to slice bread, not so much to learn how to slice bread themselves, but to ensure that they know enough about it so that if someone else makes that discovery, they can very quickly catch up on that. So imagine, for example, 10 people all trying to make a discovery. Now imagine that they're secretive. If 10 people are secretive in their research, then for every piece of research they do, fund, they'll only get one piece of knowledge back. Now imagine that 10 people contribute into a common pool, knowledge. And they all have the tacit knowledge to understand the discoveries of the other. Now each of us has something like a thousand, because you have all these different combinations. Now each of us, ten, has access to something like a thousand different combinations of knowledge. So we can all grab a particular combination and go off and make money on it. So we are all winners. 
And that's how science actually works. That's why science since, since about 1650 in England um, has been funded by the private sector. People have done science to understand the science of others so that they can then go off and make their own profit for one of the thousand new combinations that's created. And I find that very easy to understand. So it's a combination of uh, collaboration, at, but also competition. And these, these are, in my mind, almost two ways of saying the same thing. Well, yes. Uh, there's a very good woman called Doudna who wrote a very good book on CRISPR, this new technology. And she actually, at one point, says cooperation and competition are the twin bases of science. And that's exactly what it is in, in economic reality. Scientists, particularly in the pre-competitive stage of science, come together and share knowledge because otherwise you're not going to get anywhere. Everyone understanding that once in the end discoveries are made, everyone is then going to peel off and try to profit from those discoveries in different ways themselves. If you look at the 19th century steel industry in Britain, for example, dozens and dozens of steels emerged by taking iron, carbon, and then hundreds of tungsten or copper, whatever. But they, they came together to share the technologies of how you created all these new steels, and then each individual steelmaker went off, well, I'm going to use the copper analog, and you can go and use tungsten, and we can all make profit our own different ways. And that's how it works. I, I, like, the, I like the metaphor, and this, this is at least one way that I've tried to explain the 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 beauty of the market process because sometimes libertarians emphasize individual creativity and individual autonomy so much they they sort of miss the other half of Hayek's point which is that there's 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 a there's a greater social intelligence through that collaboration and competitive process because Absolutely. each of us knows something that nobody else knows but if we don't share that with anybody it's, oh. it's, it's not useful knowledge. 99% of economic growth comes from people knowing what to copy. Copying is the basis of economic growth. Yeah. And, but the only people who can copy are those who have the tacit knowledge. If you don't know how to slice dough and make all those mistakes yourself, you can't copy the next person's sliced bread uh, recipe. So growth is a collective process of people sharing knowledge, but you have to acquire the tacit knowledge first to know how to share. So only plasma physicists can read papers in plasma physics, only biochemists can read papers in biochemists. So you do the science so that you can access the knowledge of others. And it is this collective pool of knowledge to which you have access from your own research by which we collectively grow. Matt Ridley is very good on this. Matt Ridley has written these books to show it's a you know the, the lonely inventor in his or her attic 50 years ahead of everyone else. It's a myth. The light bulb was simultaneously invented by 37 people. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. Apparently, the very day, apparently, that Edison went to the patent office and put in his patent, that very afternoon, that very afternoon of the same day, someone went into the patent office with their own patent application. Going back to your earlier example, wasn't, wasn't Edison sort of the... Uh the guy that was a great self-promoter, a, a bit of a bully himself, that, that he's, he, he sort of uh, claimed the mantle of the guy that created it, even though it wasn't really just him. Edison's a pretty awful person. Um, I mean, he invented electrocution because he, uh, he wanted to electrocute people very publicly to prove that Tesla's different sort of electricity, Edison was direct current, Tesla was AC, uh, and he wanted to show, he wanted people to stop using AC because he wanted them to buy his DC. So he went around electrocuting first animals and then humans with Tesla's AC in the hope that people would be so stupid they'll then go over to using his DC. Uh, it didn't work, but it's a reflection of how unpleasant he was. Let me just say something. You can, you can read back to the very first scientist that Aristotle talks about, the really first scientist back in the 6th century. There is no difference between the entrepreneurial method of the market person and the entrepreneurial method of the scientist. It's the same thing. You do the experiment and then you basically see what happens. And that's what entrepreneurs in the market do. It's what entrepreneurs in science do. The, the science method is the, is the commercial method. But that doesn't mean that entrepreneurs are nice people. And as we're discovering now, as we look actually at the fangs, you know, you know, there's, I'm not going to name any companies. I don't want anyone to sue me. But we now increasingly understand that just as in the 19th century, those robber barons weren't so sweet. So we're now understanding that today's IT barons aren't so sweet. Entrepreneurs in the main tend to have a little bit of psychopathology to them. And the secret of a well-run society is to harness their psychopathology to the public good, but don't let them end up running the place. Yeah, there's, um, there's, and I, and I always think of of Steve Jobs, who by all accounts was was an insufferable asshole. Um, it's a technical science term that we use on this show. Um, but 
the uh, there's this um, passage from from Human Action, Ludwig von Mises' magnum opus, where he talks about entrepreneurship, and he he talks about it very differently than almost any other economist because it's 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 a it's a judgment or a, a belief about some alternative future that they're pursuing. And there's this great passage where you know the entrepreneur proceeds forward even though the public mostly doesn't care or mocks him or laughs at him. And, and I think about that, the, um, you know, are, are they psychopaths? Are they people that, that don't really care what anyone else thinks because they're uh, maniacally obsessed about figuring that thing out that they have in their head? Uh, my wife, um, who's a textile designer, uh, makes this very point to me all the time. She says, there we are in the company and the marketing people come to us and say, look, we want you to do blue this year uh, or next year. And my wife says, why? Well, blue is really selling. And my wife says, yes, it's selling today. Yeah. But that means that it'll be green next year. And they have this conversation every year. Marketing people, apparently, I mean, obviously it's generalization, but, but you need to be an entrepreneur. Because what my wife says is that people actually don't know what they want until you present it to them. Yeah. So you go to people and say, wouldn't you prefer green? And they say, no, no, we really like blue. But next year, they're bored by green, and then they really do want blue, but they, they can't plan. So it's the function of the entrepreneur to anticipate. And in, in a Darwinian way, you need a number of entrepreneurs, all of whom are anticipating in different ways. And one of them, it turns out someone will do pink and someone will do yellow. And actually next year, the public say, you know, actually what we really want is turquoise. Yeah. And one entrepreneur has got that right in a Darwinian way, and the others, I'm afraid, struggle a bit. But that's, that's Darwinian evolution in economics. Yeah, and, and Steve Jobs was such a jerk. He thought he knew what we wanted. And he did. And, and he did, and we didn't know. We, no. we had no idea that we would be completely dependent on this thing in, in all aspects of our life, but it's, it's a fantastic thing. And, and getting back to the scientific process, you, you want those psychopaths to be free to, to come up with a new paradigm. Yes, and that's one of the reasons why you need pluralistic funding. If there's only one source of funding, which is the federal government, then there's only one paradigm that's permitted. Well, that's the danger, and it's, it's, it's not an abstract danger. We see it all the time. There's a consensus about salt. There's a consensus about fat. There's a consensus about climate change. There's a consensus about radiation. There are all these consensuses because the science is settled. But if you have pluralistic funding, lots of different charities, lots of different companies, they haven't been crowded out by government. They're having to fund science because no one's doing it for them. You end up with different people funding different sorts of science. The funder is just as important as the scientists because they're the ones who actually make it happen. Yeah. And so you want to encourage encourage as much a pluralistic world as possible. So we can't trust government science to tell us how to eat, but you're a biochemist. Um, what should we be eating? You're saying I can't have pizza and french fries. No, you can't. That's that's very sad. Don't don't go after my beer, please. But <laughs> but what is what is a what is a proper balanced healthy diet? Right. Well, first of all, let's start with beer. Beer was invented by the Egyptians. Look at them now. <laughs> Didn't do them any good. Yep. They built a few pyramids, but, you know, Egypt is not up there as a leading world nation. We're going to have to cut this part out of the show, I think. <laughs> this is the most important part yeah. of the show. So um, the three authors to read here, there are three great authors, and their work is contradictory. Okay, that's what makes it so exciting. Yeah. I've already mentioned Nina Teicholz, and I've already mentioned Gary Taubes. The third is uh, the man who wrote, uh, the man who's um, jet-lagged, the man who said eat food, mainly plants, not too much. Pollen. His name is Pollen. Now, he, he, he has a different story from Nina Tietjols because she says you can eat as much fat and meat as you want. Pollen is saying, actually, eat not too often, mainly plants, you know, natural food. So there is no... So the science is not settled. I'm actually telling you the science isn't yeah. settled, but there are only three people I trust in this area, and they're all journalists. Isn't that interesting? Not one of these people is a professional scientist working for a conventional lab. It took three journalists to smash that cartel. Michael Pollan, Nina Tietjols, and Gary Taubes are the three giants of nutrition. And the science is not settled. They're saying different things. But essentially what comes through as a sort of consensus is, and, and I would very modestly put myself forth because... Uh, I'd say my, my small contribution, is we shouldn't be eating breakfast. If you look at all the scientific papers, and there are thousands of them, that tell you that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, look at the bottom to see who's funded them. Yeah. Without exception, they're funded by a cereal company or a bacon company. It's a complete scam. 
breakfast is a really dangerous meal. My book is called Breakfast is a Dangerous Meal. And it's because you're eating it first thing in the morning, of course, when you have what's called a cortisol peak, to use a technical term. And the cortisol peak means it's dangerous, particularly to eat carbohydrates, but any food at that time of day. It's also a complete myth that eating breakfast means that you eat less at lunch. It's a complete myth. These are all myths. So the four rules are don't eat breakfast. Try to eat within an eight-hour window, i.e. lunch and a relatively early supper. Try to eat natural food rather than processed food. You see, there's a very good woman called Zoe Harkham in England who's pointed out that natural food, food in nature, is almost always only one food group. So food is either carbohydrate or it's fat. It's very unusual for nature to produce a food that has both together. What those evil scientists working for the food companies have done is they create, such as a burger or something, where you've got a nice bun and you've got the meat patty and all the rest of it. They've created mixtures of carbohydrate and fat that, boy, are they delicious. And that is very dangerous because you end up eating far too much of them. So by eating only natural food, you actually eat less because actually once you've eaten 10 carrots, you've had enough. But you can eat 10 McDonald's and, you know, you probably want an 11th. <laughs> so avoiding the bliss point, as the scientists call it, is very, very important. So to come back to the rules, the rules are don't eat too often, skip breakfast, lunch to dinner within the eight-hour window. You can show for various reasons that's very good for you. Minimise processed food, eat natural food, and within that, don't eat any foods that have been bred for the last few hundred years to be full of carbohydrate. So French fries, uh, pizzas, and all the things that you personally like have been created by evil people to make money from you, and you have to be like Ulysses tied to the mast. You have to say, I'm going to resist that. Fascinating. Um, it's that's tough love, but I'll I'll accept it as uh, as perfectly reasonable. This has been fascinating, and I'd love next time you're you're across the pond to let's do it again because there's a dozen other topics that I'd love to get into. Thank you so much. Pleasure. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.